Hi, my name is Stephanie Stillo, and I'm a curator in the Rare Books and Special Collections Division, and I am delighted to welcome you to another segment of From the Vaults. So a description that we often use for books in the Aramount Library is livre d'artiste, or artist books. So these are books that are illustrated with original artwork by notable artists. And these artists can be painters or sculptors or even architects. And the goal of these illustrations that these artists create is to be in conversation with either literature or poetry. So we've discussed several of these uh, in the past in different segments of From the Vault. So we've done collaborations between uh, Joan Miro and Andre Breton, uh, or June Wayne's illustrations for uh, 17th century poet John Donne. But today, we want to speak on a more fundamental level about how we approach Livre d'Artiste. Uh, and to do this, we are joined by our librarian in residence, Emily Moore, to speak more uh, about this topic. So, Emily, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Great. And so we have several books on the table um, that may seem a little intimidating at first, um, but you're going to help us get through that. So let's talk about what is our point of entry for Livre d'Artis? You know, it's such a great question, Stephanie. And initially looking at these three books, it looks like they might not have much in common. Mm -hmm. They pre present very differently. They're very different sizes. Um, but anytime I'm approaching a new text or a new piece of art, I try to find initially just the era of its production. Yeah. And that is what these three books have in common. All of these books were created in the immediate post-World War I period, okay. published between 1919 and 1925. Okay. And that, of course, is a time of deep disillusionment. Um, and all of the four artists involved in making these books were veterans of that war. Okay. So they each shared this sort of creative impulse to process and describe their experiences on the battlefield. Okay. Uh, but while they shared that experience, the product of that creative impulse was very different. These are not homogenous products. Hmm. And just by looking at the covers of these books, we can start to get a sense of that and also of the larger art movements of the time. So beginning with the covers, we can start here. And this is 1919's Le Fin de Monde by Fernand Léger and Blaise Sondrar. And this is a cubist book. And we have all of the abstract geometry we would expect from that movement. Mm -hmm. Coming here, we have 1922's Repetition, and this is going to be our Dada for the day. This okay. is by Max Ernst and Paul Eluard. Okay. And then lastly, we come to our Surrealist text. This is 1925's uh, Au Defaut du Silence, also by Ernst and Eluard. Okay. Um, another thing to keep in mind about this period is that artists are really heavily influenced by Freud right now. So we're going to okay. see pieces of that appearing particularly with the Dada and the Surrealism. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with Le Fin de Mont. Beautiful. Uh, so Fernand Léger, the visual artist in this project, was once described by Sandrar as being one of the three pillars of Cubism, along with Picasso and Brock. Mm -hmm. uh, so as a movement, Cubism began before World War I, continuing after, and it's recognizable by its fragmented uh, depiction of space, the simultaneous presentation of multiple points of view, and the fusion of text and image. Uh, so now that we've identified this object as Cubist, we can really locate it in the time of its creation. Okay. So again, this is made in 1919. This is immediately after the, the end of the war. And this is a time of deep disillusionment. Uh, citizens and veterans alike have both been exposed to the destructive capacities of new technology. And mm -hmm. Leger and Chardrar are no different. Mm -hmm. For his part, Leger almost died in a 1916 mustard gas attack, and Sandrar lost his right arm, though he would, for the rest of his life, pride himself on his ability to drive write and shoot without the use of a prothesis. All right, so tell me about this image here. All right, so Sandrar and Leger both approach this book with a certain element of cynicism, but also with a sense of humor. Uh, originally, Sandrar has envisioned this story as a film, so the text itself hmm. really reads as a film script, and it's what we would call a cine poem. Uh, the narrative content is this very darkly funny satire. We meet God in the form of a cigar-chewing and smoking American businessman who promotes an apocalyptic war on Earth as entertainment for Mars, the god of war. Yeah. Uh, this story is told from the perspective of one of the stone angels of Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Mm -hmm. And the way that the poetry works here is you can really see that sense of, or the 
influence of cinema on Sandrar. He uses hmm. montage, he uses rapid cuts, there are these shifts in time and location. And those cinematic devices really line up beautifully with Cubism as a style. Hmm. So on this page, for example, we have multiple perspectives showing God and the city. For example, we see his form here almost as this like little man walking in movement, almost like a yeah. strip of film. Right. We also see him here. He's recognizable by his top hat and his bow tie. So he's being presented in yeah. these really dynamic but fragmented ways that they demonstrate movement. And that sense of mobility is then underscored by the way that Leger uses color and text. Those two elements are kind of mashed up here. Uh, he's using color and text as a way to demonstrate or describe an urban environment. They kind of flash and appear mm -hmm. like advertisements. Yep. And then that structural space is furthered by actual inclusion of structural elements. Okay. Leger actually trained as an architect and worked as a draftsman. So he commonly used little things like this, like this column, as a way to kind of locate us in space. So that, along with the balance of space with color, really creates this dynamic, multi-sensory environment that we mm. get to kind of enter. And it's really intense. And it's almost as if Leger is continuing to metabolize the adrenaline that he felt on the battlefield. Hmm, interesting. Mm -hmm. So cubism, though, wasn't the only artistic style that we are looking at during this time period. There are other styles that are equally underpinned with this kind of anxiety. 100%. And that's where we can get to Dada. So Dada was started in 1916 in Zurich and was the artistic embodiment of disenchantment, of a distrust of authority, and a desire to create a visual language that described those experiences. Mm. Uh, Dada artists used visual form to critique art itself and created work out of sort of free association and mm -hmm. chaos. Uh, and this anarchic attitude is really embodied in the collages of Max Ernst. Mm. Uh, by creating a collage itself as a Dada gesture, Artists are bringing in mass-produced, lowbrow publications into the world of art through visual mashups. And in that way, Ernst was really thumbing his nose at sort of the art authority. Hmm. Uh, so Repetitions, this book here, is the first of nine collaborations between Ernst and Paul Eluard. Uh, stylistically, Ernst's work is both Dada and Surrealist. And we have many copies of other parts of his work in our collection, yeah. uh, including the collage novel uh, Une semaine de bonté. His collaborator on this book, Paul Eluard, uh, was also one of the founders of Surrealism. And Eluard's work is known for its visual quality, and he actually once said that images think for me. And his mm. poetry tends to examine love and loneliness and the human condition. And like La Fin de Monde, Repetitions absolutely has that same sort of anxiety and that pervasive weight and that mm -hmm. existential heaviness. And again, like Leger and Chandrar, Ernst and Eluard both fought in World War I, and they actually fought on opposite sides of the front in 1917 before meeting in 1921. So Ernst and Eluard meet in 1921 after Eluard and his first wife Gala track Max Ernst down after seeing one of his paintings in a Parisian exhibition. And it's important to know that all of the collages in this book were selected at that first meeting, hmm. which means that the images and the poetry were not necessarily created uh, in dialogue with each other. Hmm. All of the images came before them. Now some of the poems are going to come afterwards, uh, but some of them were certainly written before that 1921 hmm. meeting. And again, thinking about that existential weight and anxiety of the era, we see this both in the imagery and in the poetry. So for example, with Max Ernst's imagery in this book, we see recurring images of mutism and paralysis mm -hmm. and blindness. And then Eluard's work is going to be equally layered. So just taking the cover, for example, at first, I'm initially really struck by the disembodied limbs that we see mm -hmm. here. We've got hands, we've got yeah. this arm. It frankly looks a little bit like a battlefield. Mm -hmm. And then right in the center, we have this eye that behaves almost like a planet or a sun around which everything else is revolving. But the eye itself is rendered helpless or useless by nature of the string that's going through it. Mm -hmm. And these are going to be the same things that we start to see uh, throughout this whole book combined with the layered and intimate uh, nature of Eloard's poetry. So what strikes me about the images in this book is that they're so dreamlike. Mm -hmm. So can can you speak to that? What's what's going on with these? Absolutely. And what Ernst and Eluard are doing here is they're constructing what we call a psychological interior, or hmm. the sort of dreamlike space that we get to enter. Uh, so looking at this same image, we start to encounter some of the same things we saw on the cover. For example, we have disembodied body parts. We have this hand here 
holding a stem with flowers that suggests growth. A uh, three-dimensional space is described by just a few lines. And then we can see a propeller wing here. And this presumably is coming out of a World War I airplane catalog that we know that Ernst was using while he was making these collages. Oh, interesting. Uh, the inclusion of the bird here is really important. Uh, Ernst used the figure of a bird to represent mortality. As a small child, uh, his pet cockatoo died on the night that his sister was born. And so from that age, he associated birds with birth and with death and with mortality in general. Mm -hmm. And in that way, Ernst is playing with this very Freudian conception of condensation, mm -hmm. in which a single image or idea or dream object can stand for several different ideas or associations. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know that Ernst studied Freud at the University of Bonn before he was in World War I. Mm -hmm. So these would have been sort of familiar ideas to him around psychology and the unconscious. Interesting. And knowing that, the collages of this book can be seen as sort of a type of Dada, but also proto-surrealism. Mm -hmm. uh, Ernst is using collage as a way to show what's inside, as sort of a structured analogy to the unconscious. Uh, and the poem that accompanies this image uh, was likely written right around the time that Ernst and Eloard meet in 1921. So it's possible that Eloard had this image in mind as he was writing it. And like the image, Eloard's poem plays with the idea of spaces. He evokes the interior and the exterior, mm -hmm. the public when he's talking about the women he encounters on the street, and then also the private when he talks about looking for what he writes and what he loves. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's fun because even in trying to relate the image and the poem here, it's a little bit of a game. And in that way, it's actually very Dada in its gesture. Uh, we wonder as viewers here, does an inherent meaning already exist? Or am I creating one yeah. by interacting with this text? Right. And that kind of fun, playful dynamic uh, also, I think, reflects the really interesting relationship yeah. between Ernst and Eloard. So you briefly mentioned the relationship between Paul Eloard and Max Ernst. And so I think that that um, really feeds into this particular book. So, so can you talk a little bit more about that relationship and, and how that manifests in this object? Absolutely. And you know, we can't talk about Eloard and Ernst without talking about Gala, and we certainly can't talk about this book without talking about Gala. Uh, so Gala was Eloard's first wife. Mm -hmm. She's a little bit of a mystery. Uh, very little of her correspondence from this era survives. Uh, that said, if you know Salvador Dali, you certainly know Gala. She went on to marry him in 1929, and the two were together until her death until 1982. Uh, before that, however, Eloard and Gala meet in 1912 as teenagers when they're both being treated treated for tuberculosis at a Swiss sanatorium. Uh, after their recoveries, they each return to their home cities. Eloard returns to Paris, Gala goes to Moscow, and then World War I breaks out. In 1916, Gala starts to make her way across Europe to come to Eloard, where he is in France, where he's working as a stretcher bearer and writing letters to families of the war dead. The two reunite and they marry in 1917. Four years later, Eloard and Gala, as I mentioned, track Max Ernst down in 1921, and the three enter a physical relationship. And shortly thereafter, in 1922, Ernst actually moves to Paris, traveling under Eloard's passport. So I've read Gala being described as the benchmark of the friendship between Max and uh, Paul, and also as their shared wife. And that is hmm. certainly a dynamic that we see in this book. And as a surrealist text, it's important for us to keep in mind that the surrealists were really heavily influenced by Freud. And that movement can really be understood as sort of a vehicle uh, for the expression of the subconscious. Uh, the obsession that Ernst and Eloard had with Gala can be uh, sort of understood through the lens of Freudian displacement, hmm. uh, in which a person has a certain level of anxiety or bad feelings about a specific object or person, but that object is too threatening. So they reorient that anxiety and place it somewhere else. And I hmm. think that they place it in this book. Interesting. It's really interesting. Um, so as we start to go through this text, we begin to encounter Gala, uh, both in literature and then also in image. So we can see Eloard and Ernst moving away from the flesh and blood gala, the real gala, to a constructed gala hmm. that is contained here in this book. Uh, both Ernst and Eloard are really circling gala here. It's almost as if they are constructing this thing that they are simultaneously obsessed, enthralled, hmm. and threatened by. Uh, this title of this book translates to in the absence of silence, uh, which to me suggests a sort of tempest 
or a general upheaval in the immediacy of chaos. The Surrealists associated love with madness, with the abandonment of reason. And in this book, love is a total experience, and it comes from the subconscious and asserts itself with this real immediacy. Mm -hmm. um, Ellaride's poetry really acts as a mechanism through which the subconscious can express itself. And the visuals in this book are just fascinating. Uh, there's this really insistent immediacy and there's this obsessive repetition. We don't have a ton of drawings that survived by Max Ernst, but for this book alone, there are over 130 preparatory drawings. Wow. And Ernst kind of creates and destroys Gala as he goes through. She's disembodied, she's fetishized, and the viewer is sort of left to wonder whose emotion is radiating off of these mm -hmm. pages. There is uh, anger in this book, there's a curiosity, there's a certain level of tenderness. Uh, but the portraits themselves are really oblique and guarded and kind of unknowable. Mm -hmm. And it makes me wonder, you know, was Ernst drawing these from real life or was he drawing them from memory? Right. And as you move through, Gala changes. And I wonder if she's actually changing or if Ernst's experience of her is changing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in this book, both Ernst and Eloard have sort of a semblance of control, again, an ability to construct Gala and mm -hmm. the way they couldn't in real life. Uh, and it's this amazing sort of complicated embodiment of that dynamic. Yeah, it's really fascinating. I mean, at a fundamental level, there's just so much repetition here, mm -hmm. page after page after page, really hitting that point of obsession. 100%. So Emily, you have given us so much to think about here. So, but if you had to sort of conclude all of this, if you had to um, uh, go back to our original question, right, of how do we approach these books, mm -hmm. what would be your, your final thoughts here? You know, I think that abstract and modern art can be really intimidating and mysterious and kind of difficult to connect with initially. And I think Leave d'Artiste are a really wonderful point of entry for people to kind of get to know these types of movements like Cubism and Dada because we get the benefit of having text with image, which already is giving us a little bit of a guidepost. Uh, and then by referencing things again like era of production and then also experience and personality of the producers, we can really start to unlock things that appear at least at first glance to be pretty unreadable. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for all of this. This was absolutely fascinating. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us for another segment of From the Vaults. Be sure to join us next time for more treasures from the Airmount Library and more books from the Rare Books and Special Collections Division.